Now on four, the first of this evening's Drugs Uncovered programs begins with Rush, which contains some strong language. In the first drugs craze, pep pills became a symbol of rebellion for mods. Since then, every emerging youth group has had its drug, a badge of belonging. For the hippies, it was LSD and cannabis. They thought drugs would throw open the doors of perception and change the world. It was an adventure that began in the swinging 60s. Well, the philosophy of using drugs at that time was very much one of exploration. It was like opening up inner space. We were like the astronauts of inner space. And, you know, some people climbed mountains. We went and climbed the mountains of our inner landscapes. It was about seeing the world in a way that people had never seen it before. It was courageous, it was creative, it was exploratory and it was damn good fun. I think about five of us smoked about half a little joint and uh, so I must have had one puff and knew that was for me. I went dancing down the street back to my college. Smell. I remember the smell was something. It, occasionally in your life, you 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 meet someone and you think I'm meant to be with that person, or you smell something and you know that that something's going. That smell means something to you. And I knew I was going to have a long relationship with this. Don't. <laughs> In the early 1960s, dope was considered evil. In law, no distinction was made between cannabis and heroin. People didn't really know what it was. I can remember uh, two policemen from Lemon Street arresting a West African for um, a possession of a joss stick because they didn't know what it was and they'd heard about cannabis. Well, uh, I was caught coming back from India. They had four pounds and they gave me four years for it. But they saw me as a sort of... Uh, Antichrist figure who was trying to sort of um, uh, poison the galaxy or something like this. At that time, uh, drug meant um, heroin, addiction, child suicide, rape. If uh, young people heard all these uh, gruesome accounts of the effects of the evil weed and then they smoked the stuff and found that none of these things happened they would then assume that all information on drugs from adult sources were equally unreliable it induces relaxation and a sense of well-being it impairs judgment and speed of reaction and coordination it can create hallucinations. Cannabis, like alcohol, is an acute intoxicant and at least as dangerous in any responsible activity such as driving a car. Benefits are claimed and the dangers ignored. As warnings about cannabis grew, so did its status as a symbol of rebellion. Soon it reached right into the heart of the establishment. When I arrived in Oxford in 67, I ha hadn't even smoked a cigarette, and uh, let alone any dope, and I clearly had to solve this problem. So I went to the Kadena Cafe and bought a packet of Piccadilly cigarettes and uh, smoked about nine or ten of them, and then threw up on my bed. And the good thing about Oxford in those days, you had two rooms, 
So if you throw up in one room, you could go into the other and carry on. And I did this deliberately, not in order to become a smoker, but in order to smoke cannabis, because I very much wanted to know what it would do to my imagination. Duncan Fallower was not alone. Scandal hit the university when the extent of cannabis smoking among students was revealed. I did a small-scale study of the use of cannabis at Oxford. I concluded that 10% of the undergraduate population smoke cannabis when it is available, when it was available to them. I cut the figure in half, 5%, but converted it into a number of 500. Well, then it came out in two-inch headlines in the People Drug Sensation in Oxford. The senior proctor, Yardley, insisted that uh, there were no more than 20 or 30 people, and that they were all mental and physical wrecks. Their nervous systems were shot to pieces. It was nothing, really, to smoke dope, but you would meet these little groups of rather nervous people hanging around the cloisters, wondering whether they would have it a joint that night or not, and then probably deciding they wouldn't. Uh, they mostly became schoolmasters. But the, the people who were going to do it did it quite quickly, and the rest watched them disintegrate or otherwise. It wasn't just students who were learning about cannabis. So were the early drug squads. The Oxford office, this particular day, they uh, noticed that um, uh, cannabis was becoming too prevalent. Um, so they hired a punt and punted up the river in Oxford, uh, arresting uh, a student sat on the banks uh, smoking cannabis. And a good time was had by all, supposedly. Uh, I was extremely annoyed and, and read the Riot Act. That wasn't their responsibility. But I wanted to know who was supplying the cannabis to those students. You know I smoked a lot of grass Oh Lord, I popped a lot of pills I would score from Jamaicans. So in 1960, 1961, it was only that previous decade that the Caribbeans had been coming over and had settled in Notting Hill. So yes, I would go up to a cafe in Westbourne Park Road and go in the back and get uh, a big sort of wadge of Jamaican grass which would be wrapped in a newspaper like a bag of fish and chips. Like you get your dope from a, a seaman. You know, if you know a, a guy who, uh, like in the coasters, goes to Africa and say, like, bring me back smoke, <laughs> you know. And like he'd bring you back a, like a kilo of grass because in those days, like you only pay like a half a crown a kilo for it. As we went into the, the coffee bar, we sat down opposite these two people that my friend had already arranged that we'd meet to score a bit of dope from. Um, they looked at each other, whispered something, and then turned to my friend and said, is he fuzz? <laughs> Which in those days was, is he a copper? And, uh, and then my friend looked at me and said, uh, uh, you better show him, Dave. So I, I undid my herringbone mod overcoat and bam, showed them my um, kaftan and beads and bells and things like that. And they said, oh, well, he's cool. And we managed to score our first quid deal. Over bridge of sights To rest my eyes in shades of green Under dreaming once you became hippies, then it was flying in the face of your parents, of convention, of, of authority, and all those things, and very obviously smoking cannabis in an evangelical way that doesn't exist now. You know, smoking cannabis because if everybody did, there'd be world peace. Smoking cannabis because, blah, blah, you know. Uh, and absolutely not drinking. Not drinking wine, not drinking a drop, being very puritanical about alcohol. No, 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 I don't drink, you know. My body, my temple people were recognising that the drug had rather limited uh, effects and were smoking it, you know, when they felt like it, but it was becoming rather more like uh, the way elderly people, you know, drink port at Christmas. It was kind of moving in that direction. My mum decides that she wants to find out what all this stuff's about, so um, 
I roll her up a joint and um, she gets this joint and goes <laughs> so I said no mum you don't go <laughs> you go <laughs> like that and she goes ah oh. and from that day onwards I bought my mum like, some, like a quarter of an ounce of dope every week for the rest of her life <laughs> What did you do there? I got high. What did you feel there? Well, I cried. But why the tears there? Tell you why. It's all too beautiful. By 1967, cannabis was the most popular street drug. In the summer of love, the hippies gathered en masse for a legalized pot rally in Hyde Park. Flower power had arrived. About 10,000 extravagantly dressed people turned up, including some very unexpected ones. I spoke briefly and announced that there weren't going to be any speeches. We've just been told by the fuzz that we can't use our loud speaking equipment. You don't need to worry about that because this is not a rally, it's a picnic. We transformed it into a normal Sunday at Hyde Park Corner, except that everyone was speaking on the subject of cannabis. Anyone who wanted to would get up onto a soapbox. And several thousand other people sprawled uh, across the park. There were no arrests. I was arrested momentarily for drinking champagne, but the policeman was bought off with a couple of cups of champagne for himself. I had the full hippie regalia on, the um, caftan and um, these nice hippie beads and this huge great sleigh bell. And then we found ourselves dancing around people in deck chairs. It was a nice sunny day and they were sitting in their deck chairs watching the swans and people rowing up and down the serpentine. And us mad idiots in our floral get-ups were all dancing around them going, You! Make love! Be free! Be happy! Whoa! Have a flower! It's all too beautiful! And then we moseyed off to the Hilton Hotel and um, all arm in arm, we all surrounded the Hilton Hotel and we were all kind of dancing around it going, we want pot, we want pot. Meditation, asceticism, birth, death, change, creation, destruction, and ganja. In 66, 67, 68, we really thought we could change the world. And we would change the world and marijuana become legal. We really thought that would happen. Legalization didn't happen, but cannabis was now out in the open. The rally was followed by an advertisement in the Times, the top people's paper, calling for the law to be changed. It was signed by an eclectic mix of opinion formers, the new establishment. The paper earned the nickname the Pot People's Paper, and cannabis had become the acceptable face of drug taking. But for those still climbing the mountains of their inner landscapes, there was another drug which would never lose its edge of danger. This man is dancing with his shadow. He is on a trip, a trance induced by LSD. This may last 10 hours and be followed by confusion or temporary insanity. After um, we'd smoked the dope, we thought we'd better try this LSD stuff as well. And, um, you know, paid a pound for our LSD experience. And then, um, you know, somebody said, well, it's going to be an hour before it works. An hour? All right, an hour. So, I mean, literally, you know, to nearly the minute, you know, things started to go fuzzy around the edges. But I do remember, look, uh, a friend of mine said, oh, do come over here, Duncan. There's some rhinoceroses climbing out of the ISIS, which is the Thames doctor. Uh, onto the opposite bank, and uh, uh, I said, uh, oh, Percy, there aren't, I'm afraid. That was my awful inability to see something that wasn't there. Um, but he, he saw these rhinoceroses, and later he said elephants, and I think he was transported into some kind of African safari atmosphere in the middle of Oxford. It takes you beyond 
your own life beyond anything you experience. And whether it's good or bad, whether it's pleasurable or not, it's significant. It it's, seems so much more significant than ordinary existence. <laughs> LSD and the hippies went hand in hand in the summer of love, but the drug had a darker history. I must have been among the first people in England to use LSD and to use it uh, legally. I, I was directed by my doctor to a clinic. I was, had migraine and been having it for years, and she said, I think they do hypnotism. So I went and I got this doctor who said, no, I don't do hypnotism, but there's this drug which we've, we're using these days called lysergic acid dye something or other. And it will make you regress to childhood and remember various things. And I think there's probably something in your childhood that is causing this migraine. And I was injected in the buttocks with uh, LSD and put to bed. Clinically, it works by giving the patient an understanding of their unconscious processes, which are basically ground in their early childhood. Problems, conflicts, difficulties that they sustained in the earlier years of their life which have been forgotten. In the 1950s and 60s, doctors experimented with LSD, a new drug whose effects mimicked those of schizophrenia. Psychiatrists saw it as a shortcut to the unconscious, and it was put to some unusual uses. I've taken the drug myself under guidance 15 mm -hmm. years ago. And there's no argument. You can go right away back to your babyhood and experience the fantastic things out of your babyhood of which you are completely unconscious. I put my head down between the bed and the wall and pushed and pushed and pushed until I emerged. And the doctor, I think, was there at that time and he said, do you think you're being born? And I was, I know that. What I got out of it was a feeling that I was living at an entirely different planet, not planet, plane, that I, I was living as I had any chance of living outside this drug, that this was the true living, that I understood everything. It didn't do any good for the migraine, but it was a wonderful experience. soon leaked out about LSD's ability to transform not only perceptions of time but of sight, sound and smell. In the early days before the drug was made illegal, liquid acid was put on blotting paper, sugar cubes, even stamps to make it more palatable, and a new drug craze was born. The pioneers christened LSD psychedelic or mind expanding. But the psychedelic vision was hard to put into words. It's all to do with colour, it's all to do with round, with shape. It's, everything's colour. Everything, you know, is, oh, it must be to do with orange. Not only with orange, but, oh. I haven't seen colour. I live in a monochromatic world. You're coming out of the black and white 50s, right? Everybody's got their hair shaved up, up, up here. They're all wearing suits. There's black and white television, you know? Don't know anything about colour suddenly take this stuff or shoot it up and another world goes bam suddenly you realize hey this isn't such a bad place to live in providing um i'd like to everybody to live in this world and i'd like everybody to have a chance to so i dispensed as much as i possibly could to turn on the world <laughs> 
got an eyedropper, put the required, required amount on each of these sugar cubes, you know, in a Tate and Lyle box. And I didn't know you could absorb it through your fingertips until the little man, Mr. Cube, the Tate and Lyle logo, began dancing around and acting just like he was stoned out of his head. And we realised that uh, you could absorb it through your fingers. I thought it would uh, take the violence out of the world, it would spread love, and the people would see the similarities between themselves and other people rather than the differences. And uh, it was also good for your body. Your body felt purified, glorious, glowing, smooth, shiny silver after you'd taken it. I'd never felt so satisfied in my life as I did when I took acid. Made love for about three days afterwards. You know. um, total revolution in every way. In the early days of taking acid, it was a religious experience, and it was not approached by 30 years of ascetic life, so that you see the white light through, uh, you know, through working hard at it all your life. Yes, a lot of theologians would say it was a shortcut, a cheap key to uh, the divine vision. But nevertheless, early on, you'd prepare yourself, wouldn't eat that day, you know, have a little fast, da 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 you know, have uh, records of Krishnamurti playing as you're preparing yourselves, read, you know, yes, dial religious tracts before you go in, read Alpert and Leary's book based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Oh, yeah. And beautifully religious. It was great. You can either spend Twenty years in a cave doing yoga exercises and breathing exercises to, the, to get an enhanced state of consciousness, or you can drop a tap of LSD. We didn't have the facilities for yoga. But taking a trip out of your mind was not always the route to enlightenment. Most people did not suffer serious effects from LSD. Some did. And the difficulty is, as with any drug, that you can never predict which people are going to be badly damaged and which are not. Because LSD, like other drugs, including cannabis itself, a very mild drug, uh, can trigger off a kind of depth charge into the unconscious. And with people, where there is a lot of turmoil and a lot of confusion, a lot of pain there, the drug may have a devastating effect. So for some people, the experience was of hell, was of real disintegration and terror. A lot of people who weren't particularly stable started taking acid. It's kind of one thing taking acid in a room full of people you know very well and you've grown up with them and you're used to having a lot of fun with and laughing to taking it in a club with a load of strangers and uh, and there's some muggers in the room and there's some danger and you might get busted by the police and uh, that kind of edge of paranoia just sort of gradually crept in over the years. I've seen people um, in psychotic states. I've seen somebody trying to rip their skin off their face um, because they believe their head is an orange and they're peeling the orange. Uh, I've actually seen them sort of digging their nails into their cheeks and, and have to, um, help stop and do that. I mean, it is, it is a dehumanising drug. I remember taking this particular acid and uh, suddenly getting very frightened. And once, sort of, once you get frightened, it kind of breeds itself until you become terrified. And I ran across these fields and found a deserted church. And I can remember banging on the door of this church, screaming at God to let me in. And God didn't let me in because there was no one there. But uh, in my mind, I could see sort of devils laughing in the sky at me and stuff like that. And uh, I didn't get in the church and just felt it, it had all gone wrong. There was no God. Experiences like these earned LSD a reputation as the heaven and hell drug, and it was made illegal in 1966. But as in previous attempts to nip a drug craze in the bud, legislation was a double-edged sword. As supplies of pharmaceutical LSD ran dry, homemade acid pills began to appear, and there was a ready black market for them. By 1974, 
music festivals had become a focus for those wanting to turn on, and drug taking was blatant. Thousands of people, all these fires going, all dancing around. People like the Led Zepp coming on at midnight, bam, really putting across a nice vibe. Acid, 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 acid. Anybody want some acid? Coming in from all angles. I mean, I don't remember a particular Reading Rock Festival when I spent the whole time uh, wandering around with a glazed look in my eyes and inviting people to to, to caress my, my, my corn cob. I had a lovely piece of corn on the cob with all its leaves around it. And, uh, um, it was a wonderful introduction to all sorts of interesting people. Uh, sort of gazing at this thing and, and waxing lyrical on its on its form and beauty and uh, we would we would just sort of wander through the festival and uh, through the grounds and make friends with people and uh, enjoy their company and then uh, call people in to arrest them if they were not behaving as they should so uh, befriend them gain their trust and then betray them that was my job Andy Bowman was one of a crack squad of hippie cops sent undercover to sniff out drugs at festivals. I have to say that we, we, we tended to make it up as we went along. You know, we, we wouldn't smoke uh, gold-tipped Sobranis. Uh, we, we'd be rolling our own. Um, uh, we wouldn't be smelling of expensive aftershave. You know, we, we, there might be patchouli oil on us if, if you know, that, that's the nicer end of the scale. Um, if people were not particularly clean because there wasn't very much water around, well, we, we wouldn't make sure we popped out to the police compound to have a wash. You know, we, we would be the same as everybody else. And it wasn't hard. As reports from the undercover cops came in, their boss realised the official view of acid as a small-scale problem was way off the mark. When I sat down afterward, and began to analyze uh, the intelligence that we'd gained, it became apparent that uh, the incidence of the use and the supply and the request for LSD far outstripped what was normally expected. And this raised a, a, a very real question mark in my mind. You hear the cry of 1,000 parties. Where was the acid coming from? Tiny pills called microdots were flooding the market. The police launched a massive operation, codenamed Julie, to track down the dealers. I remember consciously moving from Bath into Wiltshire. One of the reasons that I moved from Bath into Wiltshire was because the Wiltshire didn't have a drug squad. That would be at 73. I think I decided, I'd had a hard time for some reason or other, and I decided, right, tough, I'm just going to deal properly and I'm going to get a nice cottage, get a nice car and get a nice phone and I'm just going to work very, very hard instead of lying around smoking dope all day. If I paid £100 or something, I'd sell it for 110 Missed a 10%. We used to send things through the post, uh, packets of tea, get a packet of tea and put 5,000, take the tea out and put 5,000 uh, microdots in it, seal it back up again, wrap it up and send it through the post. D I did 70,000 in one year. I didn't used to count it myself. But the police were counting. Within two years of the festivals, Dick Lee and the Operation Julie team had uncovered a huge network of hippie dealers supplying acid from two illegal labs, not just to Britain, but to the world. The police planned a series of mass raids, those in the drug ring suspected nothing. What is it they say about paranoia? You're not really paranoid, they really are, really are looking for you, you know? But then what, if you've got paranoia about the police watching what you're doing, then you have, to, you have to overcome it, you have to think, well, I'm paranoid because I'm dealing drugs. Therefore, I, that man is not following me around, so eventually when they did follow me around, I didn't see him. I said, no, no, he's not there. <laughs> Stu 
Stuart Lockhead's microdots were coming from an illegal lab in a suburban London street. Dick Lee led the raid on it. We found uh, a packet open with, I think, 14,000 pounds in uh, notes stuffed in it. We found half-eaten Chinese meals with fibres and tenors stuck in it. They had a very good taste in whisky. Um, he told me that they were handling enormous sums of money because money was of no value to them whatsoever. Bearing in my mind, we were living on £3.15 a day subsistence allowance <laughs> and hadn't been throughout the, the operation. We certainly had a very clear idea that we were dealing with uh, probably the most valuable commodity on Earth. It was a weight for weight. It was the most valuable thing on, on the planet because a gram of it was worth so, so much money as opposed to a, a gram of gold. The police were amazed at what the operation uncovered. Enough LSD to make 300 million pills and vast assets in Swiss bank accounts. It literally blew the whole official picture of drug abuse in Britain and the world. It ran into hundreds of millions, uh, in excess of 300 million pounds. At 97, 1990, uh, 1977 uh, values, which I understand now is somewhere in excess of a, a, a billion pounds. It's the largest seizure uh, in the world. Stuart Lockhead was sentenced to eight years for his part in the drug ring. The price of acid rocketed overnight. When I went to Dartmoor Prison, where there was quite, uh, there were some of the, the Cray gang and quite a lot of East End villains. And when they read the press and saw the, the amounts of money involved, it really opened their eyes. I think a lot of these villains suddenly realized they should be in that line of business. The hippie dream was dead, but a new generation was waiting to dance on the grave. were no respecters of tradition. They mistrusted hippies and scorned their drugs. They wanted something fast, furious and physical. And an illegally made powder, amphetamine sulfate, appeared to fill the breach. The energy rush it gave you earned it the street name Speed. Punk was made for speed, really, because it had just got a driving bass beat all the way through it. And it just, you know, it was just like that all the time and it made you want to go you know it made you feel like you're on top and you could march down the road and you could do anything sulfate suited punk because punk was very much about musically at least it was about short fast songs and sulfate is about a short fast experience <laughs> It was also politically correct because it was cheap and proletarian. The buzz of speed was very grindy and jangly and jittery and shredded nervy. It was a powder that you snorted and it tasted like ground up razor blades ingested directly from a toilet floor. It was foul. It stinks. Um, why on earth? I mean, I, I used to 
sniff it or snort it, we called it. We sort of use a tube and shove those and <laughs> do this. And all you could taste for hours afterwards is taste like liquid vomit going down the back of your throat with your saliva. And oh, it was horrible, and it used to sort of smell like, like cat's urine. And I, I don't know why on earth I used to take it. It was so bloody horrible. Like the actual taste and smell of it was so foul. It was awful. Um, you know, you, you could tell if a speed dealer had walked into the pub because, like, you'd think somebody's wet themselves. Oh, no. Mrs. Biggs just walked in, you know, type of thing. <laughs> The amphetamine sulphate in crystal form was also known as biker sulph. It was generally considered to be distributed, if not actually manufactured, by various bike gangs. Uh, and indeed, those of us at the NME who enjoyed our sulphate would tend to get it from guys with long plaited beards and all over leathers. <laughs> We found that there were a growing number, only a few to start with, a growing number of people who had the knowledge and had the access, um, access to equipment to manufacture their own amphetamine sulfate powder. Now, a lot of people will think that a laboratory to manufacture this sort of um, drug needs to be sophisticated, needs to be sterile, needs to be on a grand scale. Well, that wasn't the case, and that isn't the case. We found uh, in those days that people would set up an illicit amphetamine factory in a garage, in the cellars of the houses, in disused property, and they would go through and make their amphetamine, and there was a marketplace out there, and they were making considerable amounts of money. Sulfate powder was even made into pills. Speckled blues were famed for their strength. I'd actually taken a load of blues, about 45 blues, one weekend, Friday, Saturday. And I felt myself really, really hot Sunday morning. And um, <clears throat> I just thought I was sweating a lot. And I took my top off and then I just covered it in blood. And I actually looked in the mirror and I, and I, well, I thought I got stabbed or, or cut or I don't know what happened. Um, so, so out of my nut anyway, you know, just completely. And um, looked in the mirror and, and actually covered it in blood and I looked at my back and it's full of my pores just spurting out blood. So I think really it's the actual speed of the poison in the, in the speed of actually trying to come out in every which way they can. There was nothing mind-expanding about this drug. It was awful. There was the backlash. Oh, it was the backlash from, um, from the acid, you know. Uh, they had no sacrament. The punk said no sacrament. I had a terrible time getting through the punk era because of uh, lack of inspiration. Terrible music, you know. Protest music. They can't. All this sort of stuff, you know. And we'd been listening to notes that lasted for half an hour. Bang! Transfixed at these notes on, on acid. Then you get this worm, 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 worm. And um, it, it was awful, you know. I couldn't believe it was happening. Worst time of my life. Some turned to injecting sulphate for a greater hit. I used to be a speed freak at one time before I joined the band. I, was, I, I used to deal speed and I was shooting speed all the time, you know, like 14 hits a day, I'd fucking track marks like that down my arms. Whether they injected, swallowed or snorted, speed freaks soon learned there was a price to pay. And we don't care. My hair started getting really manky, my skin was bad, my teeth were getting loose. Uh, every time there was even the faintest uh, cold or flu bug around, I would get it really badly and be ill. And eventually I decided this has to stop. And getting off speed was just uh, about being really depressed and feel, uh, feeling physically totally immobile. My body had almost totally packed up 
manufacturing its own adrenaline because the speed was doing it for me. Uh, and the day consisted of just lying in bed, feeling totally, totally exhausted and powerless and depressed and pessimistic. After a while, there's only so much you can do. You can't keep hurling yourself at the wall for 24 hours a day and expect to get through it. A lot of people, it totally did destroy their brains. You know, people did have what they called fried brains, I think, at the end of the speed rush, the speed few years, because people had just, you know, they just frazzled themselves so much. They'd been so hyper and so high that after that, you, you haven't really got that much left that, that you can do anything with. And, and it was just one big crash, one big bang, when it all fell down. Eventually, your body rebels. You just get complete sleep deprivation. You don't eat much on sulfate, so you know physically you're getting quite malnourished. You know your your body's going with no fuel inside it basically. When I was in that situation, I would take some barbs, and barbs are such a a seductive thing. You know, once you've taken a few, you, you forget all about the speed. You're just into barbs then, and. and and, and once you're involved in the barbed world, it's like getting caught in a nightmare. You don't know the way out. Barbiturates cushioned the come down from speed. And they were easy to get hold of because doctors prescribed them in their millions as sleeping pills and sedatives. I was very, very green, very naive until I was about 15. And then somebody discovered what I had in my handbag and said, gee, look what she's got, you know, look what she's got a bottle of. And uh, said to me, I'd already progressed solo at that point to taking more than what was prescribed, you know, what was supposed to be prescribed. But this person said to me, have you ever tried taking a lot more than you're prescribed? Um, and I said, no and so proceeded to hand some around to everybody and take an enormous handful myself. And as soon as I started working 20 minutes later, I just remember thinking, I've arrived, I've come home. Because that's just what it felt like, I've come home. Never felt so great. Barbiturates round everything off. They make it smoother, more tolerable, easier to take. In the 1960s, barbiturates had been scorned. They didn't expand your mind, they closed it down. But in the 70s, they took off as a street drug among those seeking to cut themselves off from the world. Many turned to injecting, but there was a thin line between an effective hit and an overdose. More people died in England and Wales every week from barbiturate poisoning than uh, had died, as far as we can see, from cannabis in the entire history of the human race anywhere. I think there was a, a kind of the beginning of a build-up to the contemptuous concept of the underclass, that really there was nothing that could be done for these people. They'd passed the point of no return. Uh, they were going to die anyway, perhaps the sooner they died the better and then they wouldn't be such a nuisance to the rest of us. Now that sounds very cynical, but I think there was something of that in it, that this particular section of the population was not seen as worth saving. They were not nice, they were not your family and mine, they were a group of layabouts. 
and they weren't worth bothering about. I'm not blurred, I'm just stoned. My whole life gradually disintegrated. I just found myself living in a squat in Brixton and gradually it was like, uh, you know, on the shoreland, all the, you know, the dregs and the flotsam and jetsam sort of kind of, uh, it seemed like all the, the people who couldn't really make it in the real world, you know, the real drug world, the people who weren't able to sell drugs and, you know, keep a job down or didn't have a, you know, a supportive girlfriend or wife or whatever, uh, that kind of tribe ended up in various uh, estates around London or in London. I vividly remember waking up in a in, in a room. It wasn't my flat. It was someone else's squat, and uh, a blanket over the the window. Uh, and I woke up, and I, I had a a needle on my arm, another needle further up my arm. And as I rolled over, a needle fell out of my side and I looked down at my ankle and there was another needle sticking in my ankle. And, uh, and I just thought, this has got to be... This is it. I cannot go on like this. Injecting barbiturates caused horrific abscesses. Oh, fantastic. The drug burned the skin from the inside out. It'd be like acid eating into your skin, and it would just eat away at your skin until you got some medical treatment for it. Uh, I had an experience on my ankle with a, about the size of a 2p coin, and uh, it just went straight through to my, to my bone. And, and that wouldn't heal up. It, it didn't heal for about a year afterwards. It just, and it just oozes out pus. It's, uh, you haven't got enough, you know, blood cells to counteract, you know, this kind of infection. So really, you, you just, bits of you would rot. They'd uh, start off in the arms, and then they'd use up all the veins in the arms. They'd go into the legs, and they use up all the veins in the legs, and then they look for other peculiar veins. They might find one in the neck. I've even known the dorsal vein of the penis being injected into. Um, but most commonly, people then started um, injecting into the femoral vein in the groin. Now, the difficulty with that is that it's right next door to the femoral artery, and so that you can easily, by mistake, inject into the femoral artery. And if you inject barbiturates into the femoral artery, the femoral artery will go into spasm, and um, that will cut off the blood supply to the leg. So that a, quite a large number of barbiturate injectors ended up having lost a leg. And I remember you could go down to uh, Piccadilly and they used to sit around Eros at that time, on the steps of Eros, and there were always two or three or four people there with, with just one leg, which had obviously lost from injecting barbiturates. One morning I woke up in a room and uh, there was a guy dead, a guy called John was dead. And uh, and then I remember passing out again. And uh, when I woke up, John wasn't there. And the people with me in the room had put John's body in a sleeping bag, moved it into the, the flat two doors down and just left his body in the sleeping bag uh, because it was too much hassle to report a dead body. And, and it was just what happened and uh, and it was just like, where's John? And, oh, he's died. And it was like, oh, OK, got any bobs? He just carried on. I survived because uh, a little part of me realised that my behaviour was insane. And I went along to Tooting Beck uh, Hospital and committed myself as an insane person. 
and that's why I survived, because I was locked up on a section for 28 days. We were strangers. Barbiturates were the most lethal street drug ever, from mind expansion to madness in little over a decade. The drug adventure was over. Next week, the 80s and 90s see an explosion in recreational drugs, and more people than ever before are lured into the drug supermarket. And Drugs Uncovered continues later with an exploration of the pleasures and dangers of drug use, a love story and a cautionary tale. Fatal Embrace is at 11 o'clock tonight. Bye.